So I'm Brianna Bowen. Um, I am an instructor and a program manager for USU's Center for Anticipatory Intelligence. Um, I'm a 2013 Truman Scholar, and I currently serve as a senior mentor with the Truman Foundation. So I have the opportunity to work with the incoming classes of Truman Scholars that are selected. And on my very favorite opportunity is to work with uh, Truman candidates at USU, including Tamoya Averett this past year. Hello, I'm Tamoya Averett. I am a junior here at Utah State studying global communications. Um, I was part of the 2020 Truman uh, finalist uh, interview committee selection. I was a finalist for 2020. I don't know how to explain it, but um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here and to help you guys out with the process. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll start with a few things. I think a really competitive Truman candidate is one who has a, a, a deep interest, first of all, in public service. That's kind of what comes before everything else. It's important to know that the Truman Foundation takes a really broad definition of public service. So that doesn't even necessarily mean working for government or federal government. That can be any level of government service from the you know, state and local up to federal, but it can also be international service. It can be nonprofit service. It can be anything ranging from national security to the diplomatic corps to working with refugees to teaching at a public university. So having a deep interest in some part of public service. The second thing would be, um, a, a sincere interest in some particular issue area within public service. That doesn't mean that the candidate has to have their entire life figured out and they know exactly what they want to do forever and ever, but the Truman process basically asks you to design your life as if you were going into a very specific issue area. And so um, it, it's a wonderful exercise in figuring out, you know, what am I really passionate about, even if I am not going to go on and do this forever and ever, how would, how would I explore building, you know, a really fulfilling career around this issue area? So the subject area that I um, proposed was dealing with healthcare policy, even though my current field was actually national security. But, um, you know, at that time, healthcare policy was something that I had both a professional and a personal interest in, and it, it made for, you know, kind of a, a good area of focus. The third thing is just an established record of academic excellence, leadership potential, and uh, extracurricular involvement. Um, Truman Scholars are not all the same personality type. Not everybody needs to be an A type personality, but, but all Trumans need to demonstrate, um, I don't just think about things that I want to do to make the world better. I, I really do, you know get out there and roll up my sleeves and, and get to work. So in all the different ways that you might demonstrate that with, you know, clubs and involvements, with volunteer work, with um, activism, with advocacy, with nonprofit work, you know, all of the above um, demonstrates, you know, somebody who, who well may be a good Truman candidate. Yeah, I mean, I, I ditto everything that you just said there. Um, another thing that I would add is being very intentional and very authentic with everything that you do um, as far as like regarding your subject matter. So my interest was refugee mental health care reform and I also have a personal and professional tie to that policy and that subject issue. And so being intentional in everything you do leading up to this process will go very, very far. Uh, in general, any USU student is eligible to um, consider looking at the, at the Truman process. There's, there's a few different milestones. So the first is you need to get in touch with the Truman faculty representative on campus. So that is run through the USU Honors Program. You do not have to be a member of the Honors College. Uh, or in the honors program, but you do need to get in touch. So that's Chris Miller and Andy Ladoff currently, but uh, you know, in general, that, that role always resides within the honors program. So you reach out to them, um, and then there is a winnowing process between all of the you know, potential Truman possibles that reach out to the honors program. They winnow down and choose one or two um, Truman nominees that will be put forward by Utah State University as a potential candidate. So that's the next phase. So once you're selected as the USU's no as the university's nominee, then you will submit a full application to the Truman Foundation and uh, hopefully be selected as a finalist. When you receive uh, finalist status, then you have the opportunity to interview with the Truman Foundation 
usually in person. Pandemics sometimes change that, as Tamoya can tell you. But um, you complete an interview with a panel of, uh, you know, judges that are selected by the Truman Foundation. And then, you know, there's a, a further waiting process. And then one Truman Scholar typically per state is chosen per year. So that's kind of what the the full arc of the application process looks like. So for me in real life, I had come across the Truman Scholarship the summer before um, the start of this year. So the summer before the start of my junior year. And I had gotten in touch with Andy um, through the honors program and then with, through Brianna, she helped me as my faculty mentor. And I would say about roughly six months um, of compiling my application is what it took and lots of feedback and making drafts, sending it to Andy and, and Brianna and the rest of our team um, for edits and then getting that back. And through that six months, that's how I compiled my initial application. Um, and then we sent that off at the beginning of February, end of January-ish. And then I heard back from them in March for the virtual interview, well, the in-person interviews. Um, and then I did a mock panel actually with my team and uh, the people that were helping me out through this process. And I got lots of feedback about how to present myself and present further things in my application that I wanted the committee to know. Um, and then from there, I had my virtual interview uh, with the actual committee for the Truman Scholarship. So it, it was a long, long process. So if you're gonna do it, you gotta be in it. You have to understand that it's gonna be, it's kind of like a marathon. It took about seven or eight months to, to make it all come together and to fruition. Um, I'm also going to highlight a couple really important points. The first is the Truman Foundation requires you to apply during your junior year of college. So that is the golden window for them. And it has to do with the types of programming that they offer for Trumans. So um, a really good time to be thinking about the Truman Scholarship is, uh, you know, during your sophomore year, assessing whether that's something you might want to explore, building the relationship, you know, with a faculty mentor, with the honors program, so that when you actually reach your junior year, like lots of groundwork needs to be in place it's because Tamoya is spot on. It is a long and iterative process uh, to, to put forward a term and application. Um. I just felt like the sense of confidence, like even though I wasn't chosen as a Truman Scholar, like I still put Truman Scholar finalists on my applications. And it's like, I have this, this thing, this little like baby that I can look at that I worked on for months and months. And I can see, you know, like it, it's just really empowering for me as a student to know that like I did that and I can do hard things. And I can continue to do hard things like that. Um, and also like on a, a research level, I had to research my policy very intensely and very in depth and know the ins and out of, outs of it 100%. And so now with furthering my research and other research opportunities that I'm doing, I look at it in that same way in which like I wasn't an expert before, but I can become an expert and I can become someone who is very knowledgeable on anything that I'm passionate about and, and have that empowering feeling behind me because I, I did that with the Truman Scholarship, which was very fantastic for me. I, so my own experience it is, is similar in the sense that um, I had the opportunity when I was applying as a student to really see how do I take an issue area that I care about in the abstract and move towards being able to actually do something about it, right? It's, it's moving from the general, oh, it'd be nice if something could get better in, you know, in my case, healthcare policy. Um, what, what would that actually look like, right, in, in, in action? That's uh, what we call the policy process, right, in a whole bunch of different fields of public service. And that is such a powerful experience for a student to engage with. It's not something that you run across in many other types of, you know, classroom or research opportunities in college. So, yes, it's a tremendously empowering experience. The other thing, um, and maybe even more significantly for me, is I just spent a lot of time getting to know myself through the Truman process. And, um, and that value add of figuring out what do I care about? What am I passionate about? Do I really care about public service? What do I really want to do? You know, what are, what are the things that would drive me and motivate me in a career in my future life? What do I care about? Um, those are the types of things that, that applying for a prestigious fellowship really requires you to face and to spend a lot of time with. 
And I am serious that it doesn't matter whether or not you get the fellowship because I applied unsuccessfully for both the Rhodes and the Marshall fellowships. Um, and those were just as valuable for me in determining uh, what graduate degrees I eventually went on to do and um, you know what, what things I have focused on in my career. So, so the process itself has tremendous value independent of the outcome. Okay. Um, so when I came into this process, I had no idea what I was doing. I was very, very confused about the process and where to go forward. So I, I sought out people who had experience in this. And this is, you know, how me and Brianna came, became really close. She was my mentor and the person that held my hand the entire way. And I could not have gone through the process without her and the rest of the team. Um, so I would say for students looking for mentors, seek people who a have similar interests as you and like have that same passion for public service and wanting to serve others um and also who understand you and what it's like to be going through this process as a student because that was really important because brianna had gone through this herself and so she knew what it was like to be in my shoes and to help me through every step of the way and i think a good mindset to have like in going through the mentorship process is don't be afraid to make mistakes don't be afraid to look stupid like it's it's okay um you're gonna figure it out and you'll have a, a good team of people behind you to support you. Um, a perspective that one faculty mentor shared with me was, you want to work with faculty mentors who have been inspired by you. That, that type of um, leadership and engagement with faculty to help them recognize, you know, that I'm, I'm being my authentic self, this is who I am, these are the things I care about, I'm not perfect at it, I don't have it all figured out. But I sure do care about, you know, growing and progressing. And I'd love, you know, for you to be part of that journey as a mentor. Mentors really, really respond to that. Faculty members in many cases are happy and eager to step up to that. I think to, to sum it up in, in one word, it's, it's probably just like exhilarating. It's, <laughs> it feels like everything that you'd worked up towards for, for those however many months that you're working on this is in that one 20 to 30 minute span and it feels just freeing, like a, a weight lifting off your shoulder. I found that my mock interview was much more difficult than my actual interview as far as like nerves and, and feeling confident in what I was saying. Um, I would say a high point for me was when I got asked a question that I was like, I had been prepped 1000% on. I was like, I know this answer with absolute confidence and then inversely when i had gotten asked like just an oddball question that i had no idea on how to answer and that was okay for me because i've been i've been trained and been like if i don't know an answer to a question that's okay but it still felt unsettling not knowing the answer so i guess hand in hand is getting asked a question that you had a hundred percent confidence in and had trained for and, and been ready for and then on the other hand not knowing a specific answer spot on which is also it's okay um but in in summation the interview process itself it is hard and it is grilling but at the end of the day you were ready for this and you've done the work and you put in the foundation and you deserve to be there um so walk in with confidence they they want to get to know you so have that mindset when you go in i love it <clears throat> and i would just add um I think you walk out with a newfound sense of confidence, you know, knowing, wow, I just did that. Like I'm, I'm some pretty hot stuff, right? That I just managed to be in a room with that many incredibly smart people having a really substantive conversation. And I really held my own. That that's a booster that lasts a long time after the actual interview process. Mm -hmm.